before Cassandra Sainsbury earned the cruel nickname Cocaine Cassie by being banged up in Colombia, another Aussie was making his name in the dangerous South American country. Rusty Young is an adventurer and author attracted to the world's most troubled trouble spots. You might remember his bestseller Marching Powder about bribing his way in, yes, bribing his way in, and then living among the inmates of Bolivia's notorious San Pedro prison. But after that, when Rusty relocated to nearby Colombia, things got much crazier. He was recruited by the US government to provide arms and training to Colombian SWAT teams in the fight against the narcos and other violent thugs who ruled the streets. And no, Rusty's life isn't some drug fueled fantasy, it's real. This is Colombia's elite anti kidnapping squad. Their training but this is as close to real life as it gets. So they're shooting live rounds now. That's These right, are real yeah. bullets. Flashbangs, bullets. This is deadly serious and dangerous. These guys are clearing the rooms. First guy peels. First guy peels left, second guy peels right. This unit was established to fight the gangs and the guerrillas. Ten years ago, these groups were snatching more than 10 people off the streets each day. Explaining their tactics is best-selling Australian author Rusty Young, who helped set up this squad a decade ago. Them on the ground, they're, they're checking for weapons. How this young backpacker came to live and work here sounds like the stuff of fiction, but it's all true. I've always been a, a calculated risk taker and certainly coming to Colombia and staying in Colombia and doing the things that I did was a, a calculated risk. And I think life is, is about passion. If you don't have passion, you did anyway. So it's, it's worth taking some risks in life. His greatest risk would lead to his greatest triumph. In his early 20s, Instead of the regular backpacking route, Rusty took himself to the most notorious jail in the world, Bolivia's San Pedro prison. They all had the key to their own cells, they had to buy their own prison cells, and then later on I discovered that, you know, in, in the depths of the prison there were cocaine laboratories and you could get whatever you wanted, drugs, alcohol. <laughs> Rusty bribed his way in for an eye-opening four-month stint that would become the backbone for his bestseller, Marching Powder, a brutal portrayal of life behind bars. As soon as I got inside this prison, I was like, this is it, I've got to write a book. This is the most incredible, bizarre place in the world. I mean, I was just like, someone has to do this. And I thought, I, you know, what, why hasn't someone done this? I'm going to give it a go. In 2001, Rusty moved here to Bogota, Colombia to write his inside story. I think the Candelaria in Bogota is one of the most inspirational uh, suburbs in, in, in the world for me. This bohemian hideaway in one of Latin America's most dangerous countries was Rusty's home for a year. This is the staircase where that leads up to the apartment where I wrote Marching Powder. Wow, it is a writer's attic, isn't it, up there? It's interesting that you seem drawn to uh, the cocaine capitals of the world. Um, <laughs> do you have a drug problem? <laughs> no, I don't have a drug problem. But, um, yeah, I mean, I, I, do, I do find the drug trade absolutely fascinating. Only Colombia could offer Rusty his next unlikely career opportunity. Again. After a chance encounter, the scruffy writer was considered the right stuff by US military contractors. With degrees in finance and law, and now fluent in Spanish, Rusty was approached to join a newly established secret anti-terror unit. So I was like, 
uh oh, <laughs> what am I getting? What am I getting myself into, and, and how and how did I get myself into this mess? What would you know about counterterrorism? Before I worked for the U.S. government, I'd never I'd never fired a weapon, never even held a pistol. Um, they did need someone who was bilingual, who was professional. Um, you didn't. I wasn't involved in the frontline military operations, but above all, they needed someone they could trust. Or Rusty's role was to import weapons and provide logistical support for the Americans. Did you feel completely comfortable being aligned with the US government in a country where they've had a chequered history? Um, a good question. As soon as I saw what we are doing, I was like, this, I want to be part of this. I was like, look, you, you, forget the politics. Who cares whether it's the US or Australia or the UK that's doing this? Give me the political justification for kidnapping someone and chaining them by the neck in the jungle in a, in a barbed wire cage. Give me the justification for that. There is none. So as soon as I saw what we are doing, I was like, this, I want to be part of this. Colombia's history has been written in blood. For decades, it was known as the most violent country on the planet. You have incredible levels of human rights abuses torture, rape, you know, incredible battles and selective assassinations, bombs. When Rusty arrived, Colombia was still suffering the aftermath of the narco wars led by Pablo Escobar. The country was at risk of imploding, stricken with left-wing guerrilla groups, far-right paramilitaries and a truly corrupt government and army. Hundreds of thousands of people had been disappeared, code for tortured and murdered. You must yes. feel like you're far away from the troubles of Colombia up here. Do you? Yes, I am. This is the place where I can really retreat and have good air. No one knows the cost of that violence more than Hector Abad, one of Latin America's most acclaimed novelists, journalists and commentators, waging his own war with words. What are you fighting for? Well, you fight for truth, for example. You fight for a more tolerant and non-violent country. Hector learned of the violent struggles of his country early in life. His father, also named Hector, was a doctor and a human rights advocate. This mild-mannered professor was hugely popular, fighting for the country's poorest and sickest. In 1987, this liberal progressive philosophy cost him his life. Hector and his mother found him on the driveway outside their home. Right-wing paramilitaries had shot him seven times. He was fighting violence. He, he was thinking and treating violence as a disease, as a disease, a typical disease of Colombia. But he was a doctor. He didn't, he didn't carry weapons. He wasn't about to arrest anyone. No, of course not. And yet he was, he was assassinated. Yeah, he was totally a non-violent person. Do you wish that he was less vocal about his beliefs and his concerns? It is very strange because sometimes you think that, but we didn't think that they will kill him. He was so, he was such a peaceful man and uh, so mild and so, happy, and he was laughing all the time. It's this land of extremes, the ugly violence and the innate beauty that Rusty Young tackles and captures in his latest book, Colombiano. It's a really complex, confusing, beguiling country, um, and it's very difficult to get your head around. This is Jose. Tara, nice to meet you. These are the victims of, and the unwilling participants in, the endless power struggle. Catherine. 
former child soldiers from both sides, the guerrillas and the paramilitaries. And it's their experience that has not only inspired Rusty's latest writing, but his ongoing support for their rehabilitation. Nelly. See Nelly, Fernan. Oh, Nelly Tara. Nice to meet you. What did you have to do as a member of the guerrilla group? I had to go out and combat and fight battles against the army. Philae was forced into becoming a child soldier with FARC, the left-wing guerrilla group that killed his father at the very same time his mother was arrested and taken away by the army. Can you understand how people might be horrified that you were a child soldier, that that is a part of your life and that is a part of your country? I was recruited into the war and it's very difficult for someone who has their own parents who's lived in a nice family home to possibly understand that someone of the same age could then go out and have to go out and fight until the death. At 11, Sandra was kidnapped by the paramilitaries. She was trained to fight and for six years was also held as a sex slave. What happened to the young girls taken in by the paramilitaries? Normalmente siempre, por ejemplo, las chicas de cogen de colegio siempre. So usually they try and get the youngest possible girls who are 10, 11, 12 years old, and the first person who gets them is the commander. And it's a kind of a, a trophy before they start handing them around. Rescued from their captors, Sandra and Philae are the lucky ones in a country that, frighteningly, still boasts one kidnapping a day and more than 10,000 homicides a year. Why is the violence so great in this country? We are not genetically violent. We don't have something different inside our bodies or brains. It's just, um, in some ways, we are excited. We produce coffee, cocaine, very uh, alcohol. We produce um, exciting drugs, and we exaggerate maybe with everything, even with violence. <laughs> Pretty emotional. <laughs> Bit of adrenaline there with all those How reports. are you feeling after that? <laughs> Good. <laughs> Glad I'm up here. During his time with the counter-terrorism team, Rusty knew his line of work could be his own death sentence. Obviously, keeping a low profile was in my interest for my own security, but at the same time I was kind of living a bit of a double life in that I was lying to everyone around me, and that's it's a hard thing to do. But obviously you took the threat very seriously. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, it's not a boy's own adventure we're talking about. No, no. And now, while Colombia may be going through its most positive and peaceful transition in decades, Rusty fears his latest book could again put him in the firing line. This will be my last trip to Colombia. Once the book is released and all the facts of what I did with the US government come to light, it may be dangerous for me to come back to this country, so I think I'll, I'll stay out of Latin America for a while. And who would be out to get you? Um, I don't know, but <laughs> I, don't, I don't know who would be out to get me and I don't want to find out. I mean, hopefully with the peace process, journalists, writers, artists, um, political activists won't be in danger, but this is a country where, you know, as a journalist you can just get killed for making one incorrect statement. So if you're writing an entire book, you know, it's best to be outside the country.